This is episode 200 of the This Week in Marketing show. I'm your host, Sajid. Today, I'm going over the notable news and updates from the week of February 19 through 23, 2024. Also, remember that February 19th was a President's Day holiday, so not much happened on that day because office, most offices were closed. So anyway, with that, let's jump in. Um, Google's John Mueller basically uh, responded to a question on Reddit asking, uh, a user was asking or a poster was asking what to do with old content. Uh, he was wondering if he should delete, keep, or what do, should he do? And he's like, well, it's Google does not dictate the utility of old content. The decision to keep, remove, or update rests on the website owner. Uh, he says there is no upper or lower word uh, count limit. So what's helpful and uh, useful, it's up to f- it's for you to decide. And that makes sense. I mean, you know, Google is not going to say that, you know, anything that's older than uh, five years or three years expires. I mean, Google has always said, you know, create evergreen content and you should always go back and uh, modify this content. You should have, you know, metadata as to the last update date. And this is something I've covered in the past where you cannot just tweak a word and tool and change the last update date because if you do that, you're trying to game the system and then Google is going to figure out. I mean, you know, from time to time some contents you will have of evergreen content that will need to be uh, updated polished a little bit uh, you know things change even though it's evergreen other content you just keep it in there for historical purpose think of Wikipedia right you know some things uh, will always be there some things will not change especially for uh, things uh, for historical figure uh, who have uh, passed on Right. So it's up to you. Uh, with that, I think this is helpful. Uh, you know, there is no, if you want to remove some content, then obviously you can use the no index tag. Uh, other than that, uh, you know, that's about it. Let's jump into the next thing. So the other question that came up was uh, the clarification on the usage of Google indexing API. Uh, some people uh, have been saying, you know, you could use the indexing API to uh, game the system, as in you could use it to um, fast track your indexing as well as uh, visibility in the search ranking or in search results. Now, John Mueller is saying, you know, that's not true. Uh, the purpose is for indexing API is to facilitate indexing of job posting and live stream of con- uh, live stream content on Google. Uh, the narrow scope is intended to streamline the process for these particular types of content, ensuring they're promptly re- recognized and indexed by Google search engine. Now, despite the clear guidelines, there exists a trend where indexing API is applied to content types it wasn't designed for. Some users report temporary success in speeding up the indexing process for other types of content. However, John Mueller warns, it's great to see passionate people try to do more with it, but A, it's often for spam and low quality, and B, it's not supported. Essentially, while experimentation is noted, it's often associated with low quality outputs and is not officially endorsed by Google. Uh, so John Miller is saying you can t- keep trying to use it, but hey, it won't work. And this serves as a reminder, like, you know, while innovation is valued, adherence to Google's guidelines ensured the longevity and visibility of content within the search ecosystem. Now, attempting to exploit the indexing API for unintended purposes may yield brief results, but could ultimately lead to content being dropped from the index or associated with spam. And you don't want that. Right. So with that says, folks, uh, again, if you are using Google indexing API or your team is using indexing API, maybe this is the set and it's not for uh, job postings or uh, let me see live stream content on Google. Maybe you should reconsider. You've been warned. And let's move on to the next update. The next update is now uh, Merchant Center is or Google has rolled out support for structured data uh, for product uh, rolled out structured data support for product variants. Right, uh, this is building on the previous expansion of the 2022 uh, for product structured data, and uh, and the addition of shipping and returns data in 2023, which I believe was covered by me. 
Uh, now, the what the structured uh, data support for product variation enables a merchants is to showcase a wider array of product variation, offering shoppers more relevant and detailed search results directly. Which may, you know, keep come to think about it, products often come in various sizes, uh, options such as sizes, colors, materials, technical specifications like memory size and processor type. Recognizing this, so the product variant uh, updates facilitates uh, the product variant update facilitates the representation of this product variance in search results through the use of structured data and now you know you understand the whole concept which is like now you could have like you know say hey this comes in black or so if someone's seeing the product they can filter it and say if they're looking for a black leather uh, jacket your product may show up that's all nothing else the, there's another update from Google on AI-generated images in Merchant Center. Uh, what Google is saying that uh, you need to preserve the specific meta tags within AI-created imagery, aiming to maintain transparency. I mean, they're aiming to maintain transparency about the origin of these images. So when you use AI to generate images for your product listing in Merchant Center, Google now requires that these images retain the original metadata tags, specifically indicating their AI-generated nature. This requirement is centered around the trained algor algorithmic med media tag under the IPTC digital source type category, a standard for photo metadata. This tag serves as a clear marker that the image was gener created by generative AI technologies. Uh, that's all. I think Google is also while Google is pushing everyone to use uh, generative AI, they also want to pre preserve and maintain transparency as much as possible. So, you know, I can agree with that. Uh, and I like that because, you know, this creation of images from generative AI has really made a huge progress this lately. I mean, you know, the images are quite striking so if you are creating some images um, you know that are unrealistic we should definitely let people know uh, or google know that you know it's being done that way and i'm pretty sure they're doing some things in the back that we are not aware of anyhow uh, moving on to google ads land uh, there is a update in google performance max uh, what Google has done is they basically integrated their uh, Gemini model, which is basically a variant or a, I would say uh, the next gen, the next iteration of the Bard AI model. Uh, what this does, it just uh, now it can uh, it allows you or the advertiser to create uh, AI powered asset generation and image editing tools. This was announced in November and now it's rolling out globally. Uh, the tools simplifies the process of creating diverse and engaging text and image assets, essentially for capturing consumer attention across various formats. Uh, uh, other than that, it can also introduce the ability to generate long headlines, and soon it will have site link generation. Um, so this is also pretty good. Uh, soon you would be able to do a lot of things. Now, I have... I mean, you know, I've used Gemini. Uh, it is definitely a good model. One thing is, you know, you still need a human being to review and see things uh, that things are hunky-dory, right? Uh, last thing you want is to blindly allow things like Performance Max, um, Gemini model to run ads for you without knowing what they're doing. And hey, if it if it if it creates something that is not on brand, or that's incorrect, you are the person who is on the hook. Now I'm no, I am going away from sharing the news update, but I'm just sharing my two cents. Uh, is that at the end of the day, Google is a trillion dollar company, so you know it's not like you can hold them liable or you could sue them. And that's the challenge with AI, right? So if you have an automated car and if the car hits someone else, the question comes down to which, who is responsible? Is it because it's your car, but the car you were not driving, it's an AI that was driving, right? And so is it the company that made the AI? Is it you? Where does the, who is to be held responsible? And now coming back is with, this is great, uh, where, you know, 
you are able to use a lot of uh, generative AI to create ads and you know, variations, but you still have to make sure that it's uh, good. The other thing you need to know is that uh, there is this ad strength indicator, uh, and what Google is saying, using generative AI for asset creation has been shown to significantly improve ad strength, ad strength with advertisers 63% more likely to achieve good or excellent ratings. Uh, I don't personally know if you should be, just because your ad is strong by some metrics within Google, that necessarily means that this is a good ad. Uh, what it constitutes a good ad to me is if the ad converts and is able to achieve the goal that you set out to achieve. Right. That's what matters. I mean, you know, I could, I mean, yeah, I would definitely don't want to add that 0%, but um, I don't want to kind of just say, oh, I have 100% ad, but, you know, I'm, my campaign is not doing well. That's just me. Other than that, it's up to you. Okay, moving on. The last update of this week is LinkedIn has basically published a blog post as well as a guide on, you know, what, how to, or what to do with your LinkedIn campaigns in a cookie-less world. So there are five points. Uh, I will go one at a time. Uh, first of all, LinkedIn is saying first party data is king, as if we didn't know that. Uh, so LinkedIn is emphasizing the importance of a robust first first party data strategy utilizing LinkedIn audience targeting tools such as audience insights and matched audience, uh, which can help businesses such as yours collect and leverage their own data more effectively. A B testing and focus on building audience trust through transparent data practice are recommended to ensure messaging hits the mark. The second point is leverage AI for scalable success. Uh, LinkedIn is advi advising to embrace you to embrace AI and machine learning technologies to enhance targeting, personalization, and campaign optimization. Their predict platforms, their Predictive audience tool powered by AI aids in creating custom segments of high intent audiences, promising better targeting and ROI. Rethink reporting strategies as cookie deprecation affects reporting accuracy. LinkedIn suggests moving away from reliance on last click attribution models. First of all, uh, our you shouldn't be relying on last click. Last click has always been incorrect. Uh, so you need to uh, look at other data, uh, maybe data-driven attribution, other things. Um, and fourth, saying test, learn, and optimize. What they're saying is that uh, be careful about compliments, uh, complex, complex, complacency, <laughs> urging marketers to com continually test and learn to adapt to the cookie-less future effectively. Uh, regular evaluation of campaign performance, brand health metrics, and brand lift testing on LinkedIn is crucial for optimization and achieving better ROI. Lastly, fifth point is collaborate with link LinkedIn marketing partners. So LinkedIn is saying they have teamed up with specialized service provider to offer solutions tailored to challenges of cookie-less advertising. These partnerships offer practical tools and case studies to help implement better advanced targeting and measurement features on the platform. So while my takeaway with this is while, you know, this was a pseudo uh, pitch to work with LinkedIn partners, I would say there is the first two or three points are still valuable, which is obviously you have to leverage AI for scalable success. You have to look at rethink reporting strategies. And number three is test, learn, and optimize. So those are the three good points. The rest is like you can ignore uh, just because, you know, uh, unless you want to work with a LinkedIn partner, there's nothing wrong with it. But, you know, I sometimes when there is a guide or strategy, you know, or a recommendation from some of these big players, you have to understand that there is a, hidden underlying message in this case hey work with our partners if you need help which obviously you will if you really need help but oftentimes you know you might even find uh, independent LinkedIn uh, expert a LinkedIn marketing expert who can actually do the same but a much cheaper rate uh, again, that's me. We don't do LinkedIn, so I cannot talk about that. I'm just saying that's my viewpoint. Anyways, folks, that's it for this week in marketing. Remember, today was this was episode 200. 
Uh, I'm so glad I'm here. Uh, I've been able to do 200 episodes. That is fantastic achievement for myself because I started doing it for myself, not for anyone else. And if you are listening, thank you for being with me. With that, signing off until next week. Take care. Bye-bye.